Matthew Troyan was born February 19, 1913, in Kiel's Opato County, Poland, the youngest surviving child of nine. His father, Powell, was a decorative blacksmith who earned money creating artistic iron pieces for the rich Polish aristocrats. In 1916, tragedy visited the Troyan family, first with the death of Powell, and one week later with the death of Casimir at age 17. Casimir was the last surviving girl in the family and was a vibrant and promising artist. One of two of her surviving works is shown here. Raising the children now fell on the shoulders of Franciska, Matthew's mother, and Jan, the oldest brother in the family. Despite the economic hardships, education was prized in the Troyan family. All of the children finished school. During high school, Matthew studied art and designed and created sets for the school's theater group. He painted the backdrop seen in this photo, which helped to support his family. Matthew continued to draw and paint throughout his years in the gymnasium, and in 1937, at the age of 24, he was admitted to the Warsaw Academy of Fine Art and began a four-year course of study in painting with Professor Ted Pruskowski, who was the director of the academy. Matthew had been a member of the Polish youth group since he was a teenager, and as with most young Polish men, joined the Polish army at the age of 18. In the summer of 1939, Matthew sensed that a conflict with the Nazis was inevitable and asked to be sent to the Polish corridor in the north where the cavalry was readying itself to stave off a Nazi invasion of the homeland. In the third week of August, he joined the cavalry. On September 1st, 1939, his suspicions were confirmed. The Nazis attacked and the cavalry came upon a Nazi battalion in a clearing in the Tukula forest. The cavalry was victorious in its first combat and destroyed the first Nazi battalion that invaded Poland, but the victory was short-lived. A Nazi tank and heavy artillery battalion came upon the cavalry and in a few hours annihilated most of the exhausted cavalry, wiping out the entire officers' corps and 70% of the men and their horses. Matthew survived, physically unscathed from the battle, and immediately returned to Warsaw to rejoin the regular army and continue his studies. The Nazis, now with the victory in the Tuchel of Forest, pushed towards Warsaw. As Hitler's force proceeded towards Warsaw, anything and everything Polish, including the Warsaw Academy, was a target. Hitler's command to his troops, erase any traces of Polish life and culture in the world. Matthew was now forced to continue his studies in private homes around Warsaw. He graduated as a master artist in 1941, despite the rages of war, and his duties as a soldier. Even in his early works at the academy, Matthew painted pieces that showed his yearning for freedom from the traditional approach to art. He wanted to move ahead into a life of freedom that would not be tied down to form, but rather would communicate by an interaction of colors on the palette. Pruskowski, the academy's director, believed Matthew was one of the best students to have ever come through his academy, and the two became close friends. A Catholic, Pruskowski was an open sympathizer to the Jewish cause for survival against the Nazi onslaught and provided Polish Jews with food and shelter. This humane action led to his demise. At the end of December 1941, Pruskowski was taken into custody by the Nazis, brought to Auschwitz and executed for treason in January 1942. All the time unaware that he was under surveillance by the Nazis, Matthew openly befriended a number of Jews and, like his former teacher and friend, provided them with assistance. In February of 1942, Matthew came out of the Central Library in Warsaw where he worked for his brother Marion and was arrested by the Nazis. He was sent to Auschwitz the next day to be executed. 
However, Matthew's ability as an artist, his movie idol looks, and his physical strength saved him from death. Instead, he was used as propaganda, a model of the supposed humane treatment of Nazi prisoners. He painted portraits of Nazi officers and of everything else he saw. The paintings remain as evidence. In all, Matthew spent three and a half years a prisoner at the camps at Auschwitz, Mauthausen, and Ebensee, where indelible memories were engraved in Matthew's brain. These memories would stay with him for the rest of his life and forever affect his art. The emblazoned incidents from his early days in war-torn Poland to his incarceration in the concentration camps were evidenced in Matthew's canvases. The eternal struggle between good and evil was a recurrent theme in the works of Matthew. Matthew's choice of reading provides further insight to his works from the poetry of Rainer Marie Rilke to the philosophy of Nietzsche. Rilke wrote, perhaps all the dragons in our lives are princesses who are only waiting to see us act just once with beauty and courage. Nietzsche believed there was no God and that actions in life arose from our implicit motivations converted into actions and that our actions were only limited by the limitations inherent in the man that produced them. Thus, inherent evil would breed evil acts, and inherent good would breed good acts. The greatest struggle has always been against the most powerful force in man, or the force of evil. Matthew believed that what was actually seen as coming from the hand of man was the victor in that eternal, internal struggle between good and evil. Matthew's love of horses and his skill as a rider was yet another major influence on his works and went hand in hand with his philosophy of life. Matthew's need for freedom in life and in art underscored his preoccupation with painting horses. Horses represented power, a noble strength, and in a natural setting, the purest form of freedom. Matthew saw an inherent purity and nobility in the life of a horse that in man was elusive. On May 9, 1945, Matthew was liberated from the camp at Ebensee and traveled towards Dusseldorf to enter the Academy of Fine Art. Upon arrival, he began a six-year course of study at the Academy of Fine Art under the guidance of Professors Pancock, Hausier, Champion, and Schriebert. A chance meeting while at the school brought him together with Joan Miro, who guided and gave advice to Matthew on his painting. Matthew received recognition from his professors at Dusseldorf as an outstanding student and was given the honor of painting a mural on the wall at the Academy of Fine Art at Dusseldorf. Although having great respect for academics, Matthew felt he could learn more about art in museums than in the classroom. He loved museums and eagerly ingested all aspects of modernism, including masterworks of impressionists, fauvists, surrealists, cubists, expressionists, and abstract expressionists. For over a decade, Matthew experimented with aspects of all these movements, searching for his own style, the Matthew within. He used color rather than form to express his perceptions of life. During his studies at Dusseldorf, he was involved in a number of group exhibitions at Duisburg, Frankfurt, Hanover, Mulheim Ruhr, Dusseldorf and Gemuden, and Munich in Austria. In December 1950, immediately after graduation from Dusseldorf, Matthew traveled to Bremerhaven, boarded the USS Ballou, a destroyer used to transport displaced persons and soldiers to the USA, and landed in America 
with seven dollars in his pocket. His first job in America was with GE as an appliance painter. His restless spirit and yearning to spend his life painting drove him to spend time in the village of New York City. He joined the group of the New York artists, which included Pollock, Klein, Hoffman, and de Kooning. There he spent many an hour with them at the Cedar Bar, discussing art, painting, critics, and preparing to forever change the art scene in the world. During his trips back and forth from Connecticut where he lived to the village, he met Sophie and they married in 1952. He would travel with Pollock and de Kooning to Eastern Long Island, periodically painting houses to earn money. During this period, he painted his only seascapes and began his metamorphosis as an artist. One of his early artist friends, Franz Klein, said that he felt that Matthew was one of the best, if not the best, colorists of the day. However, the raucous bar scene was not for Matthew. After an outburst by Jackson Pollock, he left the group and the village art scene. He lived the remainder of his life in Connecticut, quiet, somewhat withdrawn, painting hundreds of private commissions. Matthew's style evolved during the 1950s and 60s and developed into that of a post-war expressionist. He held two one-man exhibitions at the New Britain Museum of American Art in 1954 and again in 1965. The second exhibition drew great praise from the museum's director, Sanford Lowe, who believed Matthew was a major American artist and purchased one of Matthew's still lifes for the museum's permanent collection. Matthew was a prolific artist, his style evolving as Matthew the artist developed into Matthew the master. In 1970, Matthew's wife Sophie died. The couple had no children, and so Matthew filled his emptiness and continued to perfect his art, producing hundreds of paintings. In the early 70s, Matthew befriended a woman named Mitzi, who coincidentally had been a client of Sophie's. They became acquainted and filled a void in each other's hearts. And in 1975, Mitzi became Matthew's second wife. Matthew continued to paint for another quarter century and in 2007 died at the age of 94 at his home in Connecticut with his wife Mitzi and her three children, Paul, Lisa, and Tom, by his side. Matthew's feelings about art can be summed up by saying that when the heart of the creator meets the heart of the observer, a symphony of angels sings in the heavens. Despite all he saw in life, above all, Matthew believed in hope. Hope for mankind. That we are capable of understanding one another. Hope that mankind can find agreement on principles to live by. Hope we may learn to live in peace with understanding and acceptance of the differences that are omnipresent in the human race. Matthew's art stands as evidence of mankind's atrocities and also as a testimony of his hope and belief, his faith, that we can rise above the limitations Nietzsche saw, above the very worst we have visited upon ourselves, above the horrors and the evil motivations Nietzsche thought must inevitably follow, to the most noble, honest, and elusively pure peace. Matthew's art is more than a catalog of a newly discovered artist. It is the visual correlate to the diary of Anne Frank. A permanent record of mankind's inhumanity and of one man's vision of the strength inherent in the human spirit and its ability to transmute horror into beauty. It is now time that the world comes to know this great artist and understand the power of his work. It is my pleasure and privilege 
to champion the works of Matthew Troyan, master artist. Robert H. Baker, biographer and agent for the estate.